there's one on the fourth floor, but if you got other stuff to do, yeah, I don't, yeah. Okay, panel, you may come up now, panel. <laughs> Okay, so this panel is on uh, species conservation funding. If any of you guys have, if you're going to do PowerPoints, just remember, let us know, and we'll get a mic to you so you can stand out on the floor. You will. Okay. Um, there, It's a big panel, and this will be kind of like the first one yesterday, five to seven minutes making their key points, and then with the time remaining, we'll take questions. I've got some now, but I'd rather you ask them. Um, so you guys get involved. That said, we will start in this order here with Deborah Freeman, an attorney from Trout Rayleigh, Montana, and Whitwer Freeman. It's one of those long law firm Sorry. names, right? Yeah. I'm going to do everybody. Dead, so you can wait one second, and I'll get out of your way. David Brown, uh, the GPA director, Lower 48 West BP America. Then Eric Hulse, the associate vice president, Working Lands Environmental Defense Fund. Terry Fankhauser, Executive Vice President, Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Julie Grogan Stewart, Deputy Chief of Staff, USDA N NRCS. And finally, Chris West, Director of the Rocky Mountain Regional Office of the National Fish and Wildlife Federation. Deborah. Um, I'm assuming that. You can just walk through the slides with me. Okay. Um, great. I, I was asked to talk about species conservation funding from the standpoint of the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program, um, and specifically from the standpoint of a water uh, user organization called SPRAP. Um, and this is an organization that was formed to assist in implementation of certain efforts and assist in funding efforts uh, to back up the state in its participation under the program. So it's an example um, of a private funding organization that has interfaced uh, really successfully, uh, we think, with the state of Colorado in implementing the PLAT program. Um, I'm going to click through really quickly some slides on the PLAT program just so you understand the context here for SPRAP. I think many of you know about it. It's a basin-wide program uh, established after many years of negotiation in 2007. Signatories are the Department of Interior and three states, uh, Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. And it's got a dual purpose, uh, to assist uh, in, in bringing benefits to the target species and to serve as an ESA compliance vehicle for water users. Next slide. Um, the species, there are four of them, three birds, uh, least turn piping plover, uh, whooping crane and a very big fish, the pallid sturgeon. All four are federally listed. Next slide. Um, and just quickly, you'll see in the blue the Platte Basin. Uh, Colorado and Wyoming are the headwater states. The habitat and the birds are down in the bend of Nebraska. Next slide. And just very quickly, why the program, long and short of it is. Water users, and this may be a, a difference when you're looking at land-based things a bit. You know, water users, we have a chronic federal nexus. Uh, you know, we pull 404 permits, we have land use authorizations, we've got FERC licensing, we have reclamation contracts. If we are not in Section 7 consultation today, we will be tomorrow. Chronic federal nexus. and dating really from the late 70s, we could not successfully get through Section 7 consultations on the plat. We were stalled out. Depletions were viewed, even if they were minor, to contribute to jeopardy, and the consultations and BOs were just not issuing on a way that was satisfactory to water users. Um, next slide. 
Um, and then the last thing on the program, what does the program do? It brings substantial um, land and programmatic water mitigation to the table. Um, we are very proud of what the program has accomplished for the species. Um, we've got over 10,000 acres of riverine habitat along the central plat for the species. We've exceeded the nut of what we had signed on collectively through the three basins to do at this point. Uh, substantial steps in bringing online the water component to get the water when it's needed, where it's needed for the species, and a, a very, at least to me, a very thrilling adaptive management plan. We are in the process of truly closing an adaptive management loop, having tested a key hypothesis on how to manage and adjusting the management. We're going through facilitation right now and are on track to make that closed loop decision in June. Um, so very successful. The Programmatic mitigation that is done serves as mitigation for individual water users so they don't have to self-mitigate, essentially. Rather than replacing their depletions one for one, they can rely on the program's mitigation to do that when they go through Section 7. And there's a streamlined process for them to follow for their BOs. Um, next slide. So um, the program is very expensive. For the first 13 years, the arrangement, it is a federal state 50-50 cost split. And the three states have worked out what their relative contributions will be, both in cash and in-kind contributions. 20% uh, Colorado, 20% Nebraska, 10% Wyoming. Um, next slide. And then uh, Colorado, uh, each state has approached it differently. For example, Nebraska contributes primarily water during the first increment. Colorado, more money. Um, and Colorado's uh, contribution during the first increment has been met, the financial one, largely through the Species Conservation Trust Fund that was established by the uh, state legislature uh, a number of years ago and also through SPRAP contributions. So very quickly, um, I've got two slides on SPRAP. Um, what is SPRAP? It is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, and it was formed by water users. Um, we felt that we needed a forum to educate our resource users about ESA and about the PLAT program. We wanted a voice. Um, we wanted to be able to have an organization that could meet with the service if there were misunderstandings or problems. Through SPRAP, we have a water user seat at the governance committee table on the PLAT program. And by raising money through our membership, we really are instrumental in helping implement and we actually pay for operationally the water mitigation that is done by Colorado under the program. Um, next slide, last slide here. So how do we do that? We are contributing now about $1.1 million per year that goes to operation of water retiming um, things in Colorado, which is what's required under the program. We have membership um, based on categories of use, types of water use. These were set up by the water users. And in fact, our municipal entities um, pay the majority of the costs, and they do so to try to give some relief to our ag users. It is an equitable thing that the water users have worked out. Um, People come in, they pay annual assessments. And why do people come in? If you want, the way we've structured this is if you want to rely on the program as your programmatic mitigation, so your utilities, you don't have to self-mitigate, the way you do that is by becoming a member of SPRAP. 
that's how you can rely on the program by paying those annual assessments. So we kind of have a, uh, because of the success of the program, because of what it is offering for ESA compliance, we have um, substantial membership. People are, are realizing that this is a benefit to them and they are willing to pay for that benefit. Um, and we bring that to the program. We are very thankful for the, the leadership of the state um, for making this available to us. Good morning. Um, I'm Dave Brown with the BP, and we're proud to be a sponsor of this uh, this program. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things involving uh, two aspects of uh, of things that I think are critical to the states becoming more involved in um, in ESA issues. The first one I'm going to talk about is data acquisition and how it's managed, and the second one I'm going to talk about a project down in Southwest Colorado, a wildlife mitigation plan that uh, was very successful. And I will talk about funding on both aspects um, as I move through them. Let me talk about the data acquisition. So we all know sitting in this room that there is a lot of data being acquired on wildlife. Our industry in particular, when we go out, particularly on federal lands, is required to do wildlife surveys. And, and these can be single species surveys, which are not that expensive, to multi-species surveys that can uh, be very complex and cost quite a bit of money easily into six figures. But we're not the only ones collecting data. There's a lot of data being acquired by academia, conservation groups, state game and fish. Um, and, and so one of the thoughts that, that we've been talking about for years is how do we take all the data and make it usable? Um, where is all this information flowing? Because I think if you have all the information on a given species, I think it puts the states in a very good position to be able to respond to petitions or during the status reviews of a given species. So that is something that I think needs some attention, and, I, and that's something I recommend to WGA that they look into. Now, where this data resides, a lot of, a lot of the states have set up heritage programs, some of the colleges and universities hold it. Some of the state game and fishes, uh, fish agencies hold it. But the question is, do we have all of it? And, and so when you look at that, you have to say, where's the, how can we do this? How can we get a mechanism in place to get it in, in one place? Wyoming is an example of a state who I think is doing it right. They have an entity known as the Wyoming Natural a Diversity Database, which is housed at the University of Wyoming. And for, for, the, for the last number of years, they have made a concerted effort to reach out to people that acquired data, and it's being consolidated at WIND, W-Y-N-D-D, and that has been extremely beneficial to responding to petitions or status reviews. So um, I think if we have the best current science put into place to compile this data, I think it's going to put, again, as I emphasize, put the states in a better position to respond. Mm -hmm. The funding of this is basically through the state legislatures um, up there, and they get federal grant money. So again, I, I think there's options available to fund this effort. I think each state needs to house this information. I think we need to understand what each state is doing and how much information they've been able to compile. We in the industry reached out to all the consultants working for us and asked them in Wyoming to send everything they get into wind. And I think it's been very effective and useful. So, so that's my first funding request is, or, or funding aspect, is, is to look at trying to, um, again, enhance our, our data collection and its use in, in ESA um, situations. Let me talk about my next area that I want to discuss about funding. And that was a wildlife mitigation plan that was put into place in Southwest Colorado. For those of you who have been to Durango, um, and flown to the airport, um, that this area that was assessed for a wildlife mitigation plan is basically centers, it's, it's a it's two county area, but it's in that in that specific area around the airport. Um, it covers Archuleta and La Plata counties. Now, I always get a question, why did you do this? Well, back in 2008, the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission embarked on a rulemaking that required consultation between proposed activities of oil and gas with now the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, one of the things 
that was of concern was how do we get regulatory certainty through that process? So one of the things that was discussed was wildlife mitigation plans. And there is a provision in the current Oil and Gas Commission rules to allow wildlife mitigation plans. So with that being the case, we felt, okay, if, if we can make the consultation process more efficient, um, these wildlife mitigation plans may be the vehicle. So what we decided to do was engage the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, discuss the concept, then find someone who could do landscape scale modeling. And the entity we found that could do that at that time we felt was most qualified was the Nature Conservancy. And they used a process called development by design to go through and identify all the areas in these two in these two counties where the best habitat resided, where if you had to do some offsets or you wanted to establish a bank, a conservation bank, they could help identify those areas. And that turned out to be very effective. It took 18 months to do. But I want to emphasize one thing about this. This isn't going to happen without collaboration. And I heard them talk about it here on the panel before us. It takes a lot of collaboration and coordination. And CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, in conjunction with TNC, as well as other stakeholders involving federal land management agencies, such as the Forest Service and the BLM, all played a role. We were able to identify areas and through conservation easements, set up a wildlife mitigation project with a, a bank that's in place that BP uses to offset from. Um, let's talk about the funding. So to get this going, BP made an initial cash outlay to work getting TNC's work done, um, to also involve itself in terms of funding wildlife monitoring and some wildlife surveys that were part of the mitigation plan. Um, so we did fund the cash outlay, but there were some in-kind contributions made by CPW. And I will tell you that I personally believe that the amount of resources CPW put into this project probably equals what we put out in terms of cash. There was repeated meetings. We worked on this document for 18 months, as I mentioned. There was a lot of ground truthing done by CPW staff to verify what TNC came up with their models. So I think, again, it, it, you have to be innovative when you're looking at things like this, when you're setting up um, you know, conservation banks, um, in our case. Um, I, and I think you have to look at ways of, of determining what is the best funding mechanism to get it done timely. Again, we upfronted it, but CPW played a huge role in, in terms of getting this done. So um, I'll leave it at that and see if you have any questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm Eric Holst with Environmental Defense Fund. I'm based in Sacramento. Um, so I think you're all probably familiar with this dynamic, which is common uh, here during the campaign season, which is that you know a reporter asks a candidate a question, something like, candidate so-and-so, why did you cut funding for third graders and, and uh, puppy dogs? And the candidate says, I think a better question is, why do you hate America? Um, so I'm going to do the same thing here, which is I've been asked a question about uh, you know, how to finance endangered species conservation, and I'm going to answer a different question. Um, and that question is, despite all the money that we've spent on wildlife conservation in the West over the last 10 years, why do we still have declines in the population of species, and why do we continue to have these endangered species conflicts? It seems like the money is not being put uh, to as good a use as it could be put. You know, yesterday in, in the sessions, I heard a lot of this sentiment that uh, it might be a state or a local government or an NGO saying to the federal government, look, we've done all kinds of good things for this critter. We've protected land, we've removed fences, we've restored roads, we've removed invasive weeds, we've done a great thing. And then the response back sometimes from the Fish and Wildlife Service is, well, we agree, you've done a great thing. In some cases, it's not enough, you know? And we're gonna have to list the species. And there's a frustration out there, a, a sense that um, the folks don't understand why they're getting the responses that they're getting. So I have uh, four uh, policy recommendations. I don't have a lot of time, but I'm just gonna put them out there. I think there's four things that could be done in the policy realm to help alleviate some of these problems. And so I'm gonna summarize them here and then I'll go into a little bit of detail and then I'll pass it off to Terry. But um, 
So number one, we need a common currency for conservation. And number two, we need consistent conservation planning methods and consistent mitigation standards everywhere. Uh, number three, wildlife agencies need more people. And combined with that, this is part of number three, wildlife agencies need more people and they need to do a better job of partnering with states and local governments and NGOs to get their work done. And finally, number four, I think we need to, I think we need a major transformation of policy around uh, creating incentives for pre-listed species. Okay, so those are the four points. Let me really quickly summarize these or give you some detail and then if you're interested in more detail, please catch me afterwards. We need a common currency. Um, you know, think about, if, you're, if there are any baseball fans out here, think about the transformation and how teams evaluate talent on baseball, baseball players in the last 10 to 15 years. Many of you have read the Moneyball, and I'm an Oakland A's fan, and, and the A's developed a system uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago of, of more precisely managing talent for baseball players, and it transformed baseball. Unfortunately, it's, <laughs> it's born fruit more for teams like the Boston Red Sox and others than it has for the Oakland A's, but, but nevertheless, it's the, the ability to, to have a common currency to describe talent in, in a baseball player has, has improved the game, and it's improved the success of many teams. So I think we need the same thing in conservation. We talk about acres protected, miles of stream restored, and the, unfortunately those things mean different, th th those measures mean different things to different people, and I think that results in some of the conflict we have. So I'd like to propose a measure which would be called functional acres. It's a measure of the value of an acre, the potential value of, a, of an acre for a particular species or group of species. Um, this is the, uh, measure that's embedded in various habitat exchange proposals that you see out there, the Colorado Habitat Exchange, the Nevada Conservation Credit System, uh, Conservation Exchange in Wyoming. Uh, why potential value? What I mean by potential value is the value that a species might find. It's not necessarily the occupancy of a, a particular acre, but it's the potential value. So why potential rather than actual occupancy? Well, wildlife, plants move. Sometimes it's strategically, sometimes it's somewhat aimlessly but they're not always in the same place. And we need to have uh, that sort of safe harbor elsewhere, even if they're not there today. Um, so I think that concept makes sense. But if you're thinking about incentivizing landowners, if you only incentivize the landowners who sort of hit the lottery and have the critter there today, you're missing the opportunity to, uh, to create a friend for wildlife somewhere else. So uh, I think that's really important, a common currency. Secondly, common standards common methods for conservation planning and common standards for mitigation. This is a deeply, deeply wonky topic. And I won't go into any detail except to say that, um, uh, and I will say that in meetings like this, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service often gets beat up. Thank you, you know, Gary, for, for, uh, for being here um, and, and answering every question put to you. I, I want to praise the service for a product that they put out two days ago. Um, it's a mitigation rule. It was published in the Federal Register, and it's a really good product. And I think uh, it, 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 much like the 2008 wetland mitigation rule has, has the chance, has the pro possibility, has the probability of bringing coherence to a system that um, is too haphazard right now. And I think if, if there are inconsistent standards, there can be weak implementation, there can be strong impl implementation, and those uh, uh, programs sometimes get the same level of credit in our current system. Uh, a third, uh, you know, we need more people in wildlife agencies. It's it's hard. We're 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 trying to uh, respond to 21st century uh, wildlife problems with too few people, um, and so I think that refrain has been uttered many times here. Um, and uh, I think we need a a deeper talent pool. That's not only a num the number of people, but it's you know, frankly, and I'm you know getting up there in age a little bit myself. We need a younger talent pool. Uh, the, you know, environmental sciences and conservation is one of the most uh, popular and fast-growing majors in colleges today. And I think we need to create an on-ramp for some of that talent to come in and help deal with these problems. Um, and I don't think we have that situation now. Uh, Grover Norquist is famous for saying he'd like to shrink government to the point where he could drown it in a bathtub. And uh, I think this 
sector has suffered greatly from that sentiment, which is all too common. Um, and finally, uh, we need to rethink pre-listing incentives. I just think it's too complicated. I think there's, there's many good examples, CCAAs and things of the life. NRCS does the best job of, of getting out ahead of some of these listing problems and getting money into people's hands to, to do good things. But I think it's still too complicated. I think um, individual landowners seeking to get involved with the CCAA, um, it, it's, it's too, too much hassle, too much time. So I think we need to cut the hassle factor and the cost factor by a tenth or a hundredth. Um, and I, so I think, I think there needs to be more thinking um, about how to do that. So let me leave it at that and pass it off to my friend Terry Fankhauser. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good? Great. So I'm going to come at this maybe from a fundamental business perspective. We all are special interests. We all have our own perspectives, um, whether it's our personal businesses or we're hired to work for other businesses. And I, I think anytime you talk about dollars, you have to talk about how dollars function within business, regardless of what type of business it is. I'll offer a, a sentiment in the beginning not to necessarily offend anybody um, or any specific funding source or, or initiative, but I would, I would offer, and I think Eric, you mentioned this maybe in a different way, but I would say that there possibly, quite possibly, are adequate dollars available for species conservation and species management, but those dollars are inadequately allocated. Um, and I think that rule of thumb uh, probably holds true to many scenarios, but I often think about that in context of species, uh, and, and that's a soup to nuts discussion. It's not necessarily associated with strict conservation, but it, it encapsulates litigation, regulatory uh, management hours, uh, all of our time in this room today. So three points that I would cover, one being that I believe that one size doesn't fit all with funding. I, I know efficiencies are a fundamental business tenant, but I believe in context uh, as a landowner organization and from a business perspective, we need diverse funding streams uh, through diverse programs. Um, one size won't fit all, landowners, conservation groups, um, commercial industries, et cetera, won't participate in the same programs time and time again. They want a suite of options to choose from. So diverse revenue streams. Uh, I believe that those revenue streams uh, really need to be focused at a large percentage level, not unilaterally, uh, in a pre-compliance pre -compliance fashion. We need to start thinking prospectively about species and how we manage them, uh, as opposed to being in a reactionary uh, position. This is a theme that, that carries forward. Um, those diverse revenue sources need to work across mixed land ownership. Uh, the reality of it is, especially in the Intermountain West and the West, that lands and landscapes and businesses operate across uh, many different types of lands. Federal lands, state lands, private lands, uh, you, the list goes on. And unless we're able to uh, associate the investment uh, of those resources across those landscapes, it's going to be difficult to engage the adequate stakeholder uh, interest level necessary to advance. Uh, be it commercial industry or landowners, land managers, things along those lines. Uh, my second point is, is really a return on investment perspective. Funding needs to have value to the funders. Um, that value comes uh, from things associated with the species and the habitat and the conservation of those species, but it also comes by nature of what assurances are offered to those funders those individuals that are putting the dollars up, what do they get in return? What does their investment mean, uh, not only to the species uh, and the habitat, but what's it mean personally to their business, be it a landowner, be it an oil and gas company, uh, et cetera. Um, there needs to be an element, it needs to mean something to them in, in public perception as well. There's a societal element to this uh, that's hard to pin down, um, but we certainly recognize and understand that it's an important element, especially if you live in a state like Colorado that has a ballot initiative process um, that's as easily implementable as, as what it is. Um, the public needs to understand that those investments are being made and that they mean something and they have broad, broad support. And certainly, and maybe in many cases most importantly, 
the value of those investments need to have a nexus at some level to regulatory compliance. Um, that's, a, that's a key element that, uh, that we're interested in as businesses. The third point um, that I would make, and I, I, I think that this is very important, and, and it comes to me from the context of, of the regulatory element and litigation, but every dollar invested must have an outcome for the species habitat or the environmental concern. And I think you may be, Eric, uh, mentioned this in context that we need to have a consistent currency. It needs to mean something. But dollars have to count. We have to be able to measure. What we can't measure, we can't report, and it can't be understood. So every dollar has to mean something to the species, right? Um, uh, net good, net, net positives, kind of this bottom line, it meant something in general. The resources invested isn't adequate anymore. I don't think it's adequate in courts. I don't think it's adequate in the funder's eyes. I don't think it's adequate in society's eyes. They need to know what it means. We need to know what it means as landowners. Um, so we have to associate that in some fashion. And I think the derivative of all of this is um, you'll see less litigation if you meet those three points. I think you'll see um, societal concerns start to be alleviated to some extent. There, and certainly we're not talking about the outliers here. I've sort of statistically ruled out the outliers in this because we're never, we're never going to meet their needs. But certainly from a societal perspective, specifically in states like Colorado, people that enjoy visiting this state and the population growth that's gonna happen in this state over the next 20 years, individuals want to know that those resources that they've moved here for are being cared for. Um, decrease in regulatory costs, I think this is part of our inefficiency and this is an area where we can reallocate and reassociate some of those dollars in a more outcome-based way. And at the end of the day, I think you'll increase participation and you ultimately will in increase benefit to the species because you're going to leverage that business model uh, to have more landowners, more regulated industry, more commercial business, hopefully more conservation investment um, from the conservation groups and others into what is seen as actually a positive, collaborative, meaningful outcome-based conservation management strategy. So I would leave it at that. All right. Um, well, thank you for to the other panelists. Really appreciate everybody's partnership. Um, at NRCS, as many of you know, our real focus is on win-win solutions. How do we find win-win solutions in situations? And really, through that, um, using public-private partnerships to do that. Um, so most of you, or many of you in, in this context are familiar with our work through the Sage Grouse Initiative, um, through partners like Terry and Chris and Eric and others in the room, states, local governments, um, and other NGOs. Um, but really want to talk to you about um, a, a different type of partnership um, where USDA working with the Department of Defense and Department of the Interior are um, looking to, to highlight, encourage, and recognize collaboration that's going on at the local level um, around and talk there also about perhaps some funding opportunities that um, folks may not have thought about before. So um, a couple years ago, our three agencies at the federal level came together and established a partnership called Sentinel Landscapes. And really um, the goal here is you can let you read that. Um, but the, the real purpose is, is in recognizing that there's shared value around um, military installations. Uh, DOD has a value in terms of reducing encroachment and pressure um, to allow them to fulfill their mission. Um, USDA through NRCS and Forest Service, um, we, have, we see value in terms of preservation of open spaces, working landscapes, um, conservation of natural resources. Uh, interior, mostly through fish, recognizes that there's a real habitat value around that as well. And so, um, next slide. Uh, we just to officially so far um, in the last three years of this partnership have designated, recognized three sentinel landscapes um, and we're in the process of uh, looking at our, our next round. So those, uh, the first one started out at Joint Base Lewis-McChord um, in Washington State just outside of Tacoma. Um, 
the uh, Patuxent River Naval Air Station and a much longer name than I can never remember that's up there um, in Maryland and Virginia um, and Fort Huachuca in Arizona. And that first slide that you saw was a picture of uh, some rangeland around Fort Huachuca that folks are trying to preserve as working landscapes. Next. So I want to just talk you through a few examples of, of how this works. Um, so again, the, the first one that we recognized in 2013 was at Joint Base lewis McCord outside of Tacoma, Washington. This is um, the, uh, I forget actually the different services that are there, but um, this is really the, the premier training uh, inst installation uh, for the Pacific Theater as the as the military folks call it. Um, really, this is kind of the, the last stop before troops are deployed um, in the Pacific area uh, to do kind of their last training ground. And this area really has a um, native prairie. It's really one of the last remaining um, native uh, prairie areas. Um, so collectively, through the different agencies I mentioned, through working with state partners, state agencies, um, Fish, uh, Thurston County, um, and the, the Center for Natural Lands Management, they're really the ones that brought all these folks together. We collectively have invested about $12 million um, in this landscape through easements, um, primarily, again, to maintain these working landscapes. Um, and FISH helped fund uh, Thurston County Habitat Conservation Plan to help develop a debiting and crediting mechanism for um, th particularly three species that are uh, a real management challenge for the folks on base. Uh, the Taylor's checkered spotted butterfly, the street corn lark, and the Mazama pocket gopher. Um, so you can see this, you know, you can't see a lot of detail here, but generally you can see there in the yellow in the upper right corner, uh, the, the foot, the actual boundaries of Joint Base Lewis McCord, and then the other colors are um, other areas that are perhaps rangeland or uh, that could be managed for species and grazing and working landscapes. So these are different areas where we're kind of patching together easements for this purpose. Next. Um, next, we'll take you uh, to Nevada and talk about greater sage grouse. Um, so Fallon Naval Air Station um, in Nevada is, a, is actually their top gun facility. So if you remember the, the great movie from the 80s with Tom Cruise and others, just think about Goose and Maverick um, in this context. So Fallon Naval Air Station obviously has a footprint well beyond their actual borders. Um, they have about 14,000 miles that they use of airspace, square miles, excuse me, um, around the, the air station. Um, and with different development, there's all sorts of development pressure where they're trying to, they're really wanting to reduce that um, to allow them to continue to do the training that they need to. Um, also happens to be right around that area, great sagebrush um, and sage grouse habitat. And so um, together, we've come together um, and put more than $6 million across the Department of Defense. Um, they have a great program called uh, REPI, which is the Readiness and Environmental Protection Initiative, I believe, um, program, as well as uh, they do a lot of work through the Army, the ACUB program, the Army Compatible Use Buffers program, um, and at NRCS. So we are um, collectively protecting more than 11,000 acres of sagebrush steppe ecosystem around the, the facility to again help ensure working landscapes, wildlife habitat, and reducing the uh, development potential to impact the, the installation. And again, great collection of partners from conservation districts to the local, um, uh, to state wildlife agencies, to the Nevada Land Trust, TNC, BLM was a big partner here, um, as well as the, the other agencies. The last one that I want to show you and talk to you a little bit about is outside of the West, um, is in the longleaf pine ecosystem. So um, as an example, so at, at NRCS, we're really looking to highlight some of these partnerships through our Regional Conservation Partnership Program. Um, and the, the announcement uh, sec that Secretary Vilsack made a couple weeks ago about our 2016 projects, he actually went to Fort Stewart um, to highlight, again, a great partnership effort here around longleaf pine. Um, at NRCS, we put in about $7.5 million through RCPP 
um, to a, a project that was funded or that's led by the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. And really this involves work across six or seven different installations across Mississippi, Georgia, and North Carolina where folks have really come together. Again, the focus is on easements uh, for working landscapes and also for wildlife habitat in terms of you've got the gopher tortoise, dusky gopher frog, black pine snake, the red cockaded woodpecker, and others um, where folks are really coming together here. Again, there's some money from DOD through the REPI program. Um, TNC is a big partner there. Again, conservation districts, U.S. Forest Service, Longleaf Alliance, um, state governments in all three of these states. Um, and there's a, a great collaboration um, called Surpass in the southeast around Longleaf. Um, so again, just really wanted to highlight perhaps a, a different perspective that folks may not think about, um, but there is a real nexus around um, shared mission around military installations to think about. Our, again, this partnership is really focusing on, focus on encouraging, highlighting, and supporting um, the local efforts to make those connections and really piece together um, some uh, bigger picture, perhaps, conservation value than any one of us could achieve together. So thank you. All right. I've got the coveted last spot on the panel. Um, Chris West, I'm the uh, Rocky Mountain uh, Regional Office Director for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, which we go by NIFWIF, which is a probably one of the worst acronyms ever out there, but it's so bad that we've decided to own it. And uh, so if I refer to NIFWIF, that's what I'm, I'm talking about, the foundation. Uh, what we are, and I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction to, to the work that the foundation is and how we, how we do it, and then talk about, I think, a little couple of other maybe gaps in conservation funding that haven't, haven't been addressed as much on the panel today. Um, so we're a congressionally chartered nonprofit uh, foundation. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. We have five regional offices. Uh, the Rocky Mountain office based here in Denver was the, the last to be established and has been up and running for a little less than, or a lot less than a year, about six months. Um, and what we do as a foundation is work with all parties uh, across the country as to protect the nation's fish, wildlife, and habitat resources. And we do that in a, in a, a collaborative way and focused, uh, increasingly focused on measurable outcomes and measurable results. Uh, we don't advocate and we don't litigate and uh, through a compet competitive grants, uh, we give out about, last year we gave out about 800 uh, grants for conservation programs nationwide. Um, and uh, one of the, how we do that is, is a little bit of a different animal. We are a working foundation, so we don't have a huge corpus of money that somebody gave us that we sit and, and take the interest in and spend it out every year. We are actually out working with our partners, uh, which are the federal government and the agencies, uh, corporations, we have about 30 different corporate partners ranging from Walmart, BP, in some places, uh, ConocoPhillips, so we know is also here, good corporate partners that, that uh, we look to, to uh, partner with uh, other philanthropic uh, private foundations and, and also uh, work on mitigation funding as well uh, uh, from all variety of sources, we have about 400 different mitigation funds that we administer or um, uh, across the country. So while we talk about all the, the different, uh, while the federal the partners are really important to the foundation, I really wanna spend the majority of my time today talking about private funding. And this is, is a big part of, of our value added as a foundation is, is trying to uh, leverage private funding and, and, and public funding together to address those critical conservation needs. And before I get into private funding, the, the two corporate and, and, and philanthropy that I talk about, I really think it's important to note that private funding has gone on in enormous ways through endangered species and, and through conservation activity across the country. If the Sage Grass Initiative, I, and Tim, I'll look at you, I don't know if you've ever rolled up the amount of time and energy and dollars that your private landowners have put into matching each of your SGI things. I mean, that number alone is, is incredibly important. So as we talk about private fundraising and private dollars going into conservation, um, 
what I'm going to talk about today is a part and separate than the, than the enormous contribution that landowners are doing. And if uh, if ranchers across the West ever tallied the number of hours they spent, not only at meetings but at uh, uh, on their land doing doing work that that benefited habitat, that would be an incredible number. And somehow we should somebody should a grad student somewhere should take that on as a as a try to capture a, even a sliver of what that actually is. Um, but I really wanted to focus on the other private dollars, and I'm really going to talk about. Uh, corporate and and private philanthropy and because with a lot of notable exceptions and I'm going to kind of pick on the on the sage grass efforts over the last five years as the focus of this because I was involved in that in a previous uh, position working working closely with Terry and with NRCS on um, uh, at the Colorado Cattlemen's Land Trust um, but the corporate and and philanthropic dollars I think have been sort of lacking and in, in, in with a few notable exceptions um, on the industry side and a few notable exceptions that are generally placed based on the foundation side, we as a as conservation organizations, as landowners, as agencies, haven't quite got gotten to the the, the corporate or the philanthropic dollars that may be needed to do this. And and I've heard a lot about the federal dollars and the state dollars are shrinking and the needs are increasing. And, and maybe Terry's point about allocation is important, but I think it's also important to note that, it, that we can't go back to the same state and federal pots and the, those wells are going to run dry and they're not going to be increasing. Um, so where does that put us? It puts us in going towards, uh, towards the corporate and, phil and uh, private philanthropy. Um, I think what we've also proven over the last few years, and, and people have been trying to talk, and I, I know Dave's down there and, and maybe get his perspective on this from the corporate side, is that simply going to a corporation and saying, you're working in a landscape, you occasionally make a lot of money, uh, we're working in that landscape, please give us some, is not an appropriate, an avenue that's going to work. I think we need to be looking at working with businesses to get into uh, Things the same very same points that that uh, Terry and Eric brought up about uh, working with their business model, making things um, appealing and and uh, something that they can take on as part of their business, not part of uh, uh, simply a, a philanthropic uh, uh, request of them that they should be involved in conservation. We want them to know that they that they need to be involved in conservation because it's good business. Um, and I think on the on the philanthropic side, the corporate found or not corporate private foundations. There is an enormous amount of wealth out there. There is an enormous amount of interest in conservation out there, and I don't know that we've done a very good job. And I actually I feel that we have not done a, a good job as conservationists of putting this out there, uh, species or landscape level conservation initiatives out there in a way that makes it easy for them to participate. I think that the vast majority in the sagegrass initiative, the vast majority of the private money that came into uh, conservation was was very place based. Maybe a family foundation in Western Wyoming or a family foundation in Colorado who had a specific interest in a specific valley may have put money into an NRCS funded conservation easement and, or into another um, another effort. But the vast majority of that it was born on the on the federal and state uh, government sources. And I think that we need to collectively look at, at ways to, to do this and it probably means going out to those philanthropic organizations those foundations and saying uh, what can we do to make to make this clear as to as to why it's a good investment very much like we could do for a corporation why is this a good investment for your foundation and and how can we make this more appealing because I think that uh, otherwise we're going to be leaving a lot of opportunity that we're, we all agree we're short on on resources, be it people, be it money, whatever. But if we are, we need to do a better job of, of uh, selling ourselves and selling why this is an important investment for uh, for private dollars to go into. And I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that and get some questions. Okay, thanks to all the panelists. Um, does anybody already have a question they're just ready to go with? I thought I'd turn it to you first. We've got some we've got here, but I always like to go to you guys first. We've got a hand back already, so. Chris Trees with the Colorado River District. Um, several of you mentioned valuing the habitat or the species, the recovery 
uh, values for the specific species. And I'm tempted to ask how you do that, but I suspect the answer is it's always going to be specific to the individual species and the, the various habitat. But my, my concern is, isn't dollar denominating these habitats just another area that we're going to end up fighting over and or litigating over what is the what is the value what's the benefit of valuing these habitats does it exceed the cost anybody I'm, go ahead i'm happy to tackle that quickly i, I mean i th i think the best way of of placing a, va a dollar value on a, cre a a quantifiable credit is using market uh, based mechanisms mm -hmm. so um easier said than done but but it basically uh, and, and I think this this plays out most precisely in mitigation markets where you can you know if you're if, if there's a demand for a certain type of habitat and you can quantify that uh, you open it up to the market and the market decides you know, how to set a value uh, for that uh, the, your point was the value to the species not the value of the habitat in the market Absolutely, that is the point. The, the point is, is if you can precisely quantify the value of a particular acre, the potential value for a species of a particular acre, and if there's a demand for that type of conservation, the market can then allocate the price. It's also been done through fees uh, in an MMU fee program, for example. That's another way to do it. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund believes that that using market techniques to to allocate that mar that dollar value for a for a conservation value is the better mechanism. Um, but that's that's basically how we would propose that you you arrive at a dollar value, and then if a, so, just to expand somewhat further, the more valuable a particular property is from a wildlife perspective, the more, the more the higher the dollar dollar value for that particular property in a in a functioning marketplace. Anybody else? Question back there. Got a question here. Um. I guess I've got the microphone, so I'll go first. <laughs> um, it's a question for Dave and your comments on the need for more science. And for purposes of, of this question, just accept what I'm going to say is true. But last year, Wyoming passed a statute that precluded citizens from gathering science, scientific information, basic, you know, stubble height measurements, that sort of stuff, including on public land. And I'd like to get your response to when we see something like that, how do we have faith that the state actually wants science or wants citizens to participate in that process. I'm not familiar with the statute that you cite, but um, you know, I'll accept your word to, you know, on, on the provision. Um, the point of, of my discussion on that, on that data you know, aspect is that there's a lot of data and if private, land, if private individuals have it, you know, there are another source of information as well. But the point was is that all this data sitting in somebody's shelf or in their bookcase or in their file cabinet isn't doing anybody any good. And, and the idea was is to have that information, let everybody know that there is a place that can send it where it's going to be compiled and put into usable format. Um, so if, if that exists, there's still a lot of data that's being acquired by all the other sources, such as conservation groups I mentioned, academia. We are doing a lot of data acquisition for new projects. We have to. Um, so I, even if that, that situation exists, I think there's lots of those other sources that will supplement. Does that, does that help? Not really. Well, in part, it And admitted that that could be a gap in the data if citizens have information that's valuable. But again, there's lots of other sources of information that can be used. Okay, another question. Good morning, Noreen Walsh with US Fish and Wildlife Service. Last week, a blue ribbon panel that had been convened by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and that was composed of, I think about 28 different uh, conservation and business leaders made a recommendation about how we might increase funding for doing, I think, what some of you on the panel called for, which is working very early in the process to conserve species in their habitats and not waiting until they're at emergency room status. 
And so the panel recommended that we should be using funding, existing revenue that's coming straight into the Department of Treasury, $1.3 billion that comes from development of energy and mineral resources onshore and offshore, and direct that to states for working on wildlife fish and wildlife conservation actions through their existing state wildlife action plans. So that 1.3 billion is compared with about 40 to 60 million that the states are receiving through appropriated funds right now. I'm just wondering if anybody on the panel has any thoughts about the recommendations made by that Blue Ribbon panel. Noreen, are you talking about the Land and Water Conservation Fund? Which fund is that that those dollars are coming into? These these dollars are coming from royalties for energy and mineral development. They're going straight into the Department of the Treasury. So this panel recommended that they go to fund the Wildlife Conservation and Restoration Program, which would fund the states. I mean, we need more money, right? So, I mean, I, without knowing the details of that particular proposal, it sounds it sounds good to me. We need 1.3 is a good good amount of money. 1.3 billion, and we probably need a lot more, you know. And I think, um, you know, ultimately the public's got to weigh in on this, and 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 you know, kind of give some sense of whether we as a, as a public value our wildlife to the point and value the, uh, the absence of conflict to the point that we can kind of get on top of some of these issues. I mean, fortunately still there's a lot more pre-listed species than there are listed species. So, but, so, so it gives us a huge opportunity to work on uh, you know, conservation of landscapes and ecosystems that harbor sort of an abundance of wildlife. And I think we're smart enough um, you know, in terms of conservation planning and, and, and being precise about making, uh, you know, targeting conservation to pick places that, that have a disproportionate benefit for wildlife. So I guess the only thing I would add to that is, yeah, let's, um, let's, let's appropriate more money. Let's, let's, uh, let's make sure there's sufficient funding for, uh, for on-the-ground conservation, but let's allocate it very, very precisely. Let's use advanced valuation of you know, credits to to make sure that there that that money is spent uh, in the in the highest uh, conservation value manner. Yeah, I might I might just add something to that. I mean, I, I think we have to be cautious too, depending on where those dollars travel. If they're traveling to states and counties and already being implemented in a way that is uh, locally managed and implemented for species conservation. I mean, we have to be cautious that we're not pulling those dollars out of meaningful funding streams that may have um, put uh, state-based processes and projects in place. I mean, Colorado spent $70 million on Gunnison grass, as you know, $50 million, $30 million on, on greater grass. I mean, the list goes on depending on the species. One thing I would say, and I brought the, that's why I asked the question about the Land and Water Conservation Fund. If we're buying land, acquiring land in the name of conservation, I think there's probably a more efficient and effective way to do that than, than fee title acquisition. So if, if those dollars have been going to fee title acquisition, I think there's a much better way to spread those dollars in a more effect, efficient and effective and outcome-based way than, than fee title. So we'd be glad to talk about it though. Question here. Rob Roy, Ramey. How do you quantify the success or failure or something in between of your programs and why would you choose those measures? So, you know, in, in five or 10 or 20 years. Sure, go ahead. Uh, narratively, I don't know how I answer that question. I'd look to my fellow panelists, but I mean, you certainly have to have a feedback back mechanism that we've talked a lot about adaptive management, and I think you may know the answer to your question. I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> you've got an idea about it. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. Um, but we certainly need a feedback mechanism that, that couples with adaptive management to be able to determine if what we're doing is correct. I, you know, we're, we're so risk adverse, and there's a reason why we're risk adverse, and we all know what those reasons are. And to some extent, I mean, nobody of science is perfect, and I, I think I've quoted you, and you've been quoted a number of times today about what science's role is. But we do need that feedback mechanism to make sure that our best, our best attempt 
at formulating um, measurable outcome-based science is actually outcome-based. And, and that is a feedback mechanism, a feedback loop that we use in business um, time and time again. We never get it right the first time, but we get better throughout time. And if you subscribe to a kind of a sustainability model of a continuous improvement over time, that can't be done without those metrics and without that feedback. And I think that's one of the major things we need to rely on the scientific community uh, to provide to us is, a, is information to be able to develop that and be able to measure that, my opinion. Anybody else? You know, just from the, the standpoint of, of, of my topic today, which is the PLAT program, it's kind of an interesting model. Um, the species were listed when that program started. The program is doing what it said it was going to do successfully. The species are still listed. We've got a couple species, um, take the whooping crane, you know, when your population that is uh, using this habitat numbers in the 300s and where that is an improvement over where it was when the program started, um, it, it's doing what it said it needed to do. Is that species going to be delisted in the next year or two? I don't think so. So how do you value a program under those circumstances? Um, you know, it, with the plat, I would say that that program should be valued in terms of what is it bringing to the species from a, um, not perhaps a species numbers, uh, game today, but from a habitat standpoint and from a water deliverable standpoint. Um, I also think you have to ask, is it providing a workable solution uh, for resource users? It is worth the investment in it. Um, is it allowing uh, business to go on as we need it for our water supplies in the three state region? Um, and also, how is it from an efficiency standpoint under the PLAT program to date, um, you know, over 150 consultations have successfully gone through on a streamlined basis throughout the three state basin. That is a savings uh, to Fish and Wildlife Service in terms of the processing of them. I think they would tell you that. Um, and it is a great savings um, to allow our infrastructure to go forward. Hello, uh, Tim Griffith here with NRCS Working Lands for Wildlife. The, the thing that's going through my head right now is, is, is contemplating a lot of the buzzwords, right? It's all about collaboration. It's about public-private partnership. It's about conserving landscapes. And the common recipe always involves, you know, everybody setting their, you know, personal issues aside and, and, and putting in to, to solve something. And so I'm just curious, and I'm trying to melt that idea, and I'm really intrigued with the, the, the environmental market concept and, and also the, the talk of the mitigation coming in. And I'm just trying to understand how we incorporate all of this diverse funding stream in getting the uplift in these species, but then being able to credit that to an individual producer. And so the discussions I've been in a lot here lately trying to crack that nut really lead me to believe that it's going to be the, the really important to, to have those discussions now collectively so that we avoid building a silo around mitigation and then the other public-private partnerships over here. So I, I would just be curious if you guys have been thinking through some of that or, or have some insight because it's something that's definitely on the front lobe uh, right now. I have a thought on that, Tim. Uh, and let me answer it through an example. We're, EDF is developing a habitat exchange for monarch butterfly. It's, a non, it's not listed. It's, um, and so therefore, there's no mitigation marketplace for monarch right now. Um, there are folks that that you know have a passion about the the species and want to see it protected and then there are also folks that who are potentially investing in monarch conservation as a risk reduction mechanism for the future so population is declining it's been petitioned for listing you know that that clock is ticking on sort of potential for it being sort of a you know kind of a sage grouse type of a species so uh, you know how, how could you assemble a war chest to kind of get money into 
a system that stimulates landowners to put in more monarch habitat. That's the, that's the question we're thinking through. So, so some of that, there's going to be government money for that, clearly, because I think state and federal government recognizes the value in avoiding a listing of that species. There are certain industries that we're talking to that say, you know, you know, our business model is better off in five, ten years if that species remains off the list. And so they're talking about investments that they might make. And then I, I alluded to in my comments this idea that we need to do a better job of pre-listing incentives. And I think that has to do with crediting. I think uh, registering credits for species that are nowhere near listing is really important to, 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 to be able to use um, the, sort of those market signals. And so complicated, you know, answer to this question ultimately, but aggregating those into a single pool, all those different types of funding into a single pool, and then using consistent market mechanisms to allocate the funding out to landowners willing to do to do projects, I think would be a way to bring coherence to that system. Very simply, one way to do this is a, is a reverse auction. You basically say, we've assembled a war chest that's X amount of money, say $10 million, um, and then you announce to the landowner community a particular, particularly important geography. Um, we're seeking, you sort of, we, you, you create the specs of the type of habitat that you're looking for. We're seeking this habitat and we need it, submit bids. And then you can use that market mechanism to allocate the value that you ascribe to each that particular acre or cluster of acres. Tim, I, it's a good question, but I guess contextually, I, I think it's all about coordination, but not necessarily trying to fit everything into the same neat box. Um, I, I, think, I think the ability to have diverse voluntary conservation initiatives that have criteria and standard that are standards that are, that are correlated, and that way you can, at the end of the day, put the, the results of those conservation measures into um, some sort of aggre aggregated analysis that you may use for, for a listing decision or a petition or a lawsuit or, or, or quite honestly to, to, for your feedback mechanism is important. Um, but, but really I think, I, I think allowing that diversity is important because I think it maximizes conservation, it maximizes interest, it maximizes return on investment, but you have to be able to me me measure things and report things in a consistent outcome-based way. So to me, the effort needs to not necessarily be applied to fitting the funding and the programs in one box, but fitting the, the, uh, the measurement into one box. Okay, so moderator's prerogative here, it's about almost 10.30. We have a great closing panel on why we're all here essentially, which is the act itself. But first, join me for thanking this panel. I know we've just scratched the surface of a very tough issue. We got about a 15 minute uh, break and then we'll call you back in because this last panel's gonna be, uh, I think, pretty interesting. Thank you guys. Good job. Hey John, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's my job. Kept it on time. Because the last one's huge.